So Allison Peters is a clinical exercise physiologist at NYU Langone Medical Center for Musculoskeletal Care. She received her Bachelor of Science from Sacred Heart University in Connecticut, where she was the captain of her Division I volleyball team. Allison went on to GE Capital and Tax, where she conducted weight loss initiatives for over 400 people. She's trained high-level cyclists and triathletes. She taught group exercise and ran the corporate wellness program there. Then she went on to acquire her Master of Science in Exercise Physiology while completing a graduate assistantship at Adelphi on Long Island, New York. While at, at Adelphi, she ran the university's cardiac rehab program and worked as a strength and conditioning coach for the athletic teams and worked with professional triathletes and cyclists. Welcome, Allison Peters. Yeah. Welcome, some same faces from the other marathon lectures, some new faces, so hello. Um, I am Allison, I am one of the exercise physiologists at the new Center for Musculoskeletal Care. Uh, talking a little bit about hydration. So this person did not adhere to what Andrea said. They might be mentally prepping, they might be you know, taking into account what Bonnie, our psychologist, will be saying to you, but he's hydrating. And that's what's really important, right? Hydration, the key to marathon training. So I want to talk to you a little bit about balance. What I really liked about Andrea's presentation is how you want to incorporate those carbohydrates throughout your race, okay? You're not going to throw it all in there at one point and then hope that everything sticks for your entire race and that you're fine. So it's about finding a balance between too much, too little, just enough, and when to use it. So you want to maintain equilibrium. You want that balance. You should never be overly full. You do not want a belly full of water, Gatorade, whatever your choice is for that day. All right? And you should also never be going by thirst. You should never be extremely thirsty. There's a couple schools of thought on when exactly you should be drinking, what you should be drinking. So I have a couple questions for you. Who thinks you should drink as much as your stomach can take? So as much fluid as you can stomach, so you're not feeling sick, but you're still feeling good, but you're, you're packing it in. Does anybody feel that way? Does anybody, has anybody heard that? No? That's good. Educated crowd here. I like it. How about just drink when you're thirsty? Anybody hear that one? Do people do? Hand, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Who drinks when they're thirsty? Yeah? Okay. So some people drink when they're thirsty. What I really want you to do calculate your sweat rate. Let's get a little more scientific with it. Let's get a little more of a narrow number for what you should be doing. Can I tell you what your number is? Absolutely not. You're all sweating at a different rate. You're all sweating right now. You may not feel it, but you are. So when you're running and you're sweating at a higher rate, whether it's because of your size, genetics, how hydrated you are, what the temperature is, we want to try and figure out what the best way to keep yourself hydrated is. All right? So we're going to do that by calculating our sweat rate. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about electrolyte balance and why it's important to not just drink water. And we want to know how to prepare. And this is going to be some of you. This is the New York Marathon. Who in here? Anybody running New York? Yeah? Awesome. OK, coming up. Calculating your sweat rate. So this handout, yeah, there is a handout. We have the handout. Okay, we have a handout. So first thing to do is weigh yourself. It is up to you if you would like to do this with your clothes on or off. This that only comes into play later when you're reweighing yourself. Um, when you reweigh yourself later on, you want to make sure your clothes are completely dry or you're wearing. Yes. It won't be exactly like this. It, it'll be in the nutrition handout. All right, no problem. So you want to weigh yourself. We want to know what we're working with before we go out and run. All right? We also want to know how much fluid you're carrying with you. You want to know what you're ingesting. OK? Hopefully in ounces, if you want to weigh in pounds, whatever you like. All right? Go out, do your run, and make sure you're keeping track of how long it is. But try, when you're really calculating this, preferably an hour. So this is when you've already kind of gone partially into your training. You're capable of running for roughly an hour. All right, so do your run. Come back. Dry off completely. Skin should be dry. Ladies, hair dryer. Dry every little bit out. Clothes should be completely dry. Reweigh yourself. All right. Write down how many pounds you lost. Multiply that number by 16. 16 ounces in a pound. Then, to that number, you want to add the ounces of fluid that you consumed during your run. This number is the total number of ounces that you lost while you were running. So you lost 
what you see on the scale, but you also have to account for what you drank. You replaced some of that. So now that we have our total ounces, divide that by how many hours you ran. If it's just one, that's still your same number. Then you want to know ounces lost per hour, divide that by four. Why? Because that tells me how many ounces you lost for 15 minutes. That's getting a little nitpicky. You want to replace slowly. So that's how many ounces you need every 15 minutes. Does everybody know the game at like the boardwalk or the amusement park where you're squirting the water into the little hole and the guy is slowly rising, slowly going up, slowly going up? You wouldn't take a bucket of water and just throw it at that. You'd lose the game. Your game's over. You also wouldn't partially like squeeze the trigger just like a little bit. Maybe I'll get it. Maybe No, you're going to lose. All right? This is why we want to slowly replace, slowly but surely, consistently replacing supply, demand. The body likes to be in homeostasis. We want exercise, excuse me, exercise homeostasis. All right, does that make sense? So we want to slowly keep putting back what we're taking out as we're sweating. So hydration and performance. What happens if we're too hydrated? What happens if we're not hydrated enough? What does that do for our performance? So Exercise performance begins to become impaired at roughly 2%. That is not a lot of weight loss when we're talking about running, when we're talking about sweating. So a 150-pound person, that's only 3 pounds. Okay? Losses in excess of 5%, you decrease your work capacity about 30%. You're not doing well. So originally when I was writing this, I thought I would talk a lot about the Boston Marathon because that's really easy. You know, it was um, unseasonably warm, and a lot of people got dragged out because they shouldn't have run, all right? They were given a bye. They could have run next year, but you know, no, I trained for this, I'm doing this, and then they're in the hospital. So I'm not going to talk a lot about that because, you know, a lot of you are running the New York Marathon, and you're actually going to be dealing with the cold. So the way you, you do lose a lot less, you sweat a lot less during the cold, but you are still sweating. Okay, and you want to be cognizant of how much you're sweating and how much you're losing because even though it's a little colder, even though you know you're sweating a little more efficiently, so not as much, you are still holding on to that sweat. You do want to be aware of how many, how much you're losing. Okay, so dehydration increases core temperature. If you're already starting in dehydrated dehydrated state, I don't care how cold it is outside, your core temperature is going to rise. What happens then? Sensations of fatigue start at 103 degrees. That's what studies are kind of narrowing in. In between 100 and 104 degrees, they're starting to see really strong signs of fatigue. Okay? Cardiac output decreases. Why? The volume of your blood is lower. Your blood is thicker. Okay? Your heart is having a harder time perfusing that blood because there's less of it. All right? Instead of tomato juice, we have spaghetti sauce now. We don't want that. All right, because not only do your working muscles need that blood for oxygen, your skin needs that blood. All right, the vessels in your skin need that blood, and then that's how the sweat is coming out. Everything needs perfusion, everything needs blood. If we're reducing the volume of the blood, you're putting yourself at risk for decreased performance and at risk for heat illness. All right, so heat stress paired with dehydration, it limits your cardiac output and you're not getting enough blood to those muscles, therefore you're slowing down. All right, so the larger rise in core temperature, dehydration, it increases something called, what's it called the catecholamine response. Forget about that. All you need to know about that, glycogen is breaking down faster now, okay? So what Andrew was talking about, that's our fuel, that's our sugar and all that water that we really want to hold on to, that's depleting much, much faster. So you're much more inefficient at using that fuel that you need so badly. Glycogen is, f is in a finite amount. Roughly 2,000 calories of glycogen is stored in your body. You know, some people will say if you deplete your carbohydrate before and then you really rush the carbohydrates in before the marathon, you can increase that number a lot. You really can't. If you can, congratulations, you're a genetic gift. It's not a lot. If you play with a little bit, it's roughly around 2,000 calories of glycogen. All right, so that's why we need the water and the carbohydrate. That's why sports drinks are designed. They're engineered to replenish that, and that's why we need to replenish within a certain amount of time. That's why I like every 15 minutes, take a swig of that Gatorade or whatever, maybe it's water and goo. 
all right? And you need to practice it. So once you find out the number of ounces that you're taking in every 15 minutes, sounds weird, put in a cup. Run with that cup. Know what it feels like to have that amount of liquid like just go into your mouth. It sounds weird. You're going to get really good at it if you practice it throughout your training. You're going to know exactly. So if you just want to run with a bottle instead of, I mean, because you're not going to, unless you have some awesome friends who are going to be at every water stop giving you like three and a half ounces, <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. So know what it's like to have that amount of fluid into your body. Are you hydrated? How do you know? OK, you're telling me I need this. You're telling me I need that. How do I know if I'm already hydrated? Am I already dehydrated? What do I have to do? How hydrated are you? All right, this is one way the body can tell us. And also, if you're down here, go see a doctor. All right, so a lot, I mean, in your training, you really want to keep track of how your urine is looking, OK? And this is going to help you in if you're being successful after you calculated your sweat rate to know, am I, am I hydrated? Am I, am I doing this correctly, all right? Or am I at risk? Achieving hydration, something not a lot of people talk about, prehydrating. You don't need, you know, like a football beer helmet of 20 ounce water bottles with you at all times. 18 to 20 ounces, a few hours before the race, fine. You don't want to be full before the race. You don't want to feel thirsty before the race. That's the equilibrium we're talking about. That's that balance we want to achieve. All right? That's fine. Know what that feels like. You shouldn't be thirsty. All right? And you shouldn't be doing the pee-pee dance before the race either. <laughs> you might be because you're nervous. <laughs> Rehydrating. So this can be variable. Personally, OK, calculating your sweat rate will not be a perfect science. Yes, you have those, those variables like, you know, it might be a little warmer on race day, it might be a little cooler on race day, maybe you need a little less, maybe you needed a little more fluid, maybe you were really excited, maybe you were really angry. OK, whatever you lose at the end of the day, if you have a decrease in weight, replace that weight with fluid, but then also add another 20 to 50%. 25 to 50% of what you lost because you have to account for the kidney constantly functioning. No matter how dehydrated you are, it is still creating urine to clear, okay? Signs and symptoms of dehydration. So th this isn't all of them. Dehydration is, uh, you know, a whole melting pot of awful if you really, really are dehydrated. And also signs and symptoms of hyponatremia. So... Not a lot of difference. And this isn't all of them. But they're really similar. They present as very, very similar things. So you go to the medical tent, something's wrong. Well, hyponatremia, low sodium. All that means, low sodium in the blood. OK? So dehydration, low fluid, not enough fluid. Same, same signs and symptoms, two very different problems treated to very different ways, opposite ways. What I like to do, what I tell my runners, weigh yourself before the race. Write that weight on your number somewhere on your body. And if you have a friend, bring a scale, because if the medical tent doesn't have a scale, and if you're feeling awful at the end of the race, weigh yourself. If, that, if your weight is much less, you know you need some fluid. You know you're really dehydrated. If, you have, if you're roughly the same weight, or if you have actually gained weight during the race because you drank so much water, probably hyponatremic. The more information you have, if you're feeling awful at the end of your race, the more information you can give to the medical tent professionals, the faster you're going to feel better. Otherwise, you're sitting in a chair for half an hour, and they're going to see if it's going to work itself out, or they're going to see how you're responding, and then they're going to treat you from there, because that's all they can do. They don't have enough information on you. Being prepared will help all of this. Know the weather forecast. This also means training in the environment that you're actually going to be racing in. All right, That's not always easy because of the length of the program you should be doing, especially if you're not an elite marathon runner and you really have to start slowly, which you should be if it's your first marathon. All right, Try and prepare in the conditions you will be racing in. That'll, give you, that'll put you at the best possible opportunity to be successful in being hydrated and doing really well in your marathon. So that's the acclimatization. 
calculating your sweat rate, which we talked about, having your liquids ready at all times, and also the bag drop, the controversial bag drop at the marathon. So you're tired. You just ran 26.2 miles. What do they ask you to do? Oh, go walk 20 minutes, a half an hour, and get your bag. You're sweaty. Your knees are shaking. You probably don't have any fluid left to drink. You probably don't have any food left to eat. And your, clo your clothes are cold and wet. You are at a really high risk of hypothermia. Hypothermia, OK? So you do really need to be careful in terms of being prepared for your clothes. Clothes, you want light layers. Light layers are a lot better than one very heavy layer, OK? It's more efficient in terms of sweating. You have this light, airy bubble in between those layers. You can also peel layers of very saturated clothes so you're not at risk for that when you're going to the bag drop. All right, so I wish you all well. I hope all, everybody's training is going very well.